What, if anything, can we learn from the positioning of countries on the list of contributors and about changes that may have occurred? Here are the findings concerning the nine first countries, admittedly a totally arbitrary number in decreasing order. First one is Germany, 12%, then the UK, 11%, Belgium, 9%, Finland, 9%, Israel, 8%, Spain, 7%, USA 4.5%, France 3.5%, uh, perc 70% out of the, these 10 articles were written by Daniel Gill, Hong Kong 3%. So this is altogether the nine first places, 197 articles, more than two thirds of the articles. I must admit that when I came up with this result, I had a few surprises. I never realized that this would be the distribution of contributing countries. To be sure, even if one has a notion as to what would be desirable in the daily making of a period, in, sorry, even if one has a notion as to what would be desirable in the daily making of periodicals, one works first and foremost with what is available. Needless to say, personal relations are of utmost importance here and we all have only a limited and necessarily biased number of, th of those. This explains, at least in part, the primacy of the first five contributing countries. Germany, because that's why I started planning the, the journal. The UK, especially since Kirsten Malmkier joined the editorial team. Belgium, Finland, and Israel. The marginality of a number of countries seems significant too, especially as far as countries that represent real powers on an international scale is concerned, including a heavy presence in academia. First and foremost among those is the, maybe the former Soviet Union in today's Russia, towards the bottom of the list with altogether three articles. For rather obvious reasons, I should say, which have nothing to do with target. Others that I would mention briefly are Japan, Korea, Portugal, Sweden, and Turkey. In view of what we know about the role these countries have played in modern translation studies, we would have expected to have a more massive role in the international scene. Apparently, more contacts with scholars of these countries are needed to bring about changes in this picture on both institutionalized and individual levels. The place occupied by the United States of America is the seventh, which is not surprising in view of at least two complementary things. One, the overall marginality of the USA in the world of translation studies, especially as it was conceived of in Target's ideological platform, and two, the aforementioned Eurocentricity of what the journal reflected, which is something I've already mentioned. Just a moment, please. To be sure, there was no boycott involved here like the one we know from at least one other periodical in our field. In fact, when it became topical, the whole thing of, of the boycott, I nicknamed Target the journal that boycotts no one. It is not even as if we never tried to get in touch with colleagues in those and other countries, because we did. It is only that, to the extent that manuscripts were submitted in the first place, these manuscripts tended to be rather dated in their approach in their theoretical framework and methodology and or poorly written. I would also like to emphasize that Target was never meant to be a venue for star writers. In fact, quite a number of stars had the articles sent back to them, but I have already explained why I would, no, would hold my tongue in that, this matter. <coughs> On the other hand, we have always encouraged new writers to submit their studies, not only doctoral students, but young people working on their MA thesis as well. We seem to have advanced a little in our observations. However, putting 20 years in one lump is, frust is frustrating to any attempt to sketch process, processes of entering the list, moving up and down it, or having it, or leaving it altogether. Here are some highlights. For this purpose, the 20 volumes of Target have been divided into five 
four volume blocks, which is another arbitrary number. I could have tried to play with uh, other blocks. I, I think that the results would have been almost the same. Look to me as a waste of time. Okay, now I should have had a, a transparency or something, but I don't have it. I have a table summarizing the five, five uh, eight countries per each vol uh, four, four volume block, and I'm only give, going to give you some highlights from the, this table now. Germany starts very high. First place with a full third of all articles, a supremacy which was never going to be equal by any other country in any other period. So in the first four volumes, a third of the articles were written by German, German scholars. Most of them not in German, but in English. It retains its first place in the second and third periods while going down to 13.3 and 11.5 percent of the production respectively. It then drops to eighth place with as little as five points of the uh, five percent of the articles and end up out of the top part of the list. This trajectory seems very significant. Apparently the position of Germany in the world of translation studies has gone down. Then again the percentage of German scholars of the newer generation who are publishing in English has not increased much. We have heard uh, the same claims made yesterday in a different uh, context. And not, I'm not sure, I have numbers to back them. Spain sh shows as an almost reverse curve. It's not represented at all in the first period. It then appears on the sixth place with 5% and goes gradually up to the fourth place with 8.2% and to the second and third places with 12 and 95 percent respectively. As I've already seen, that process shows signs of continuation now. The UK starts on the fifth place with 5.9 percent of the articles. It then climbs up to the third and second places with 10 and, and 11.5 percent respectively and end up on the very first place with 13.5 translation. As to the USA, it rarely appears in the, par in, in the upper part of the list and never higher than the seventh place. Let us move to another observation now. It has often been claimed that translation has become a feminine occupation. This claim seems to be true for most cultures, especially in the last few decades. Does it have any repercussions for the status of translation studies? Is the discipline or is it getting to be feminine? And what has Target got to tell us in this respect? You will have to believe me that I say, when I say that gender has never been a consideration in the exception of rejection of articles for publication. It's a matter of faith. That's what I claim and you, you won't be able to prove or disprove it. So it, would it be a hypothesis or? Nevertheless, the findings in this respect are not uninteresting. They certainly show a change along the time axis. Thus, out of the first 12 issues, 1989 and until 1993, 11 were men-dominated. I'll skip the tables, the, the, the exact numbers. There was one exception, uh, uh, volume 4.2, but this deviance from the dominant pattern cannot be assigned any historical significance. It certainly marks no change of orientation. From volume seven on, the number of women authors has been growing constantly, and we have about the same number of male and female dominated issues. The last issue so far, 20, the second issue of 20, volume 20, features nine women or contributors and only one man. And I wonder whether this marks yet another enhancement of the relative weight of women authors. Again, it would be interesting to compare the number of men and women authors in the articles that were rejected. Also, eventually, the significance of the findings concerning target will have to be confronted with the numbers relate, revealed 
by other periodicals, collections of articles and programs of conference. Thus, for instance, the first shrift in my honor, which was published a few months ago, has a proportion of 16 female to 13 male authors, and the first shrift for Miriam Schlesinger, a proportion of eight men to nine women. By contrast, the volume of proceedings of the first S Congress contained 21 articles by women and only five by men. Another parameter of potential interest could be the role played by researchers who are gay. Unfortunately, or not really, not really unfortunately, I cannot contribute anything to such a discussion. I have to admit that I was never really interested in who of my colleagues were gay, so I'm simply uninformed in that matter. So this stop without a summary. But the, the more material that I prepared for discussion, I'll just pick up one item, which is the possibility of comparing the countries that contributed to uh, target with the, the, the order of countries that, that bought, uh, subscribed to target, to, to the paper edition, no, not to what goes on on the internet, because I, know, I have no access to numbers there. Interestingly enough, it's not the same pattern. It's not the same countries that contribute articles to, uh, than, uh, as those that, that, that uh, I wouldn't say read. I don't, I don't know who reads the, the uh, periodical, but I know who pays for it and who gets it for free or as an exchange agreement and so on. And I cannot give you numbers because I, I was sworn to secrecy. And I, I, I think I even signed the document. I'm not sure. It was 20 years ago. Okay, so thank you very much. If you can make this as a topic of discussion, I would be glad to. It may, maybe there's a, a representative of the youngest period in the field sitting next to me. Maybe she could uh, react and say that it's similar, it's different. We, we have started where we, we, you, you have done part of the work for us in the last 20 years or whatever. Thank you.